Right, thank you for that. Um, so the main point that we're going to be trying to make in this paper is that landscape is a form of material culture and temporality can be examined through it like uh, other forms of material culture. Artifacts may have object biographies, but landscape has a sort of unique accretion of complexity. New features and changes to landscape were the result of projects for the future. Archaeologists often think about the remains of the past as completed actions, and the theoretical difficulty of imagining the future as full of possibilities um, kind of limits how we think about the future. And I think for that reason, there's been this greater focus on the past in the past. But as we were saying in the introduction, past and future are intertwined um, in the course of action. And we can sort of nuance and strengthen our interpretations of past agency through a consideration of the different ways that people um, negotiated their relationships to their fears, anticipations, and hopes for the future. Time has always been a major preoccupation in archaeology, and um, obviously we welcome this entire TAG conference dedicated to it. The concept of temporality in the archaeological record um, has obviously become much more prominent recently. Different people have examined different cultures' time concepts, drawing on sociological and anthropological theory. But temporality in landscape archaeology has consistently received more attention from prehistorians usually looking at the past in the past, Richard Bradley. In earlier studies of late pre-Roman Iron Age and Roman period, period Britain, you know, the traditional concepts of Romanization espoused this view that the urban and wealthy rural populations were open to change, as Laura was just saying in her paper. Um, whereas the lower status rural communities were conservative and maintained their ways of life sort of in the face of changes happening to them, kind of robbing them of their agency. Luckily, the influence of post-colonial theory um, has reduced these kinds of assumptions, but when we're looking at the manipulation of temporality, we can explore a new dimension of agency in the construction of identities through the medium of landscape. <clears throat> So today we'll look at um, how social theories of temporality intersect with the understanding of the rural landscape in the late Iron Age and Roman periods in Britain. We'll expand on these theories a little more uh, later on when Andy takes over, but the core of our paper um, is two case studies. The first is from Kent, um, where time and memory were manipulated to construct and communicate rural um, community identities, which I think was probably to ensure future group cohesion in a time of rapid change. And the second case study is on agency, futurity, and farming in the upper Thames Valley, when Andy's going to um, examine evidence for agricultural rhythms and planning for the future. Okay, and um, so giving you a background to um, Iron Age and Roman Kent would be delightful and useful, but obviously we don't have time for that, so do ask me any questions later on. The area that I'm focusing on is where the valley of the Nailborn stream, which goes like this. Um, sorry, the pixelization here makes this not very easy to read, but anyway, where the valley of the stream crosses um, this natural ridge leading up from Dover that the Roman road um, later travels along. It's an intersection of transport and communication that was a significant point of control and pausing um, along the route from Dover to Canterbury in order to descend that natural um, ridge and cross the stream. So I'm not going to describe each and every um, individual feature that we have from geophysics and aerial photographs, but just sort of one example of how memory was woven into the construction of group identity through the way that people um, chose to or by paths and boundaries were directed to move through um, the landscape. The elements that I'm going to really look at are uh, belief and memory. So to begin with, I just need to draw your attention to the extremely high density of Bronze Age um, barrows in East Kent. There are more than two per square kilometer, so each one of those dots 
um, is one of the barrows that I think is uh, Bronze Age rather than early medieval. And um, that's just a kernel density plot of the same. So these are a really prominent feature of the landscape and specifically of East Kent. Um, they, you know, had been there for maybe a thousand years before this Iron Age to Roman transition um, that we're talking about. And I think that probably the identities of the individuals buried within them and the social structure that they would have um, originally represented had passed beyond actual memory into the realm of sort of myth and legend. One of the reasons I was bringing up Gosden and Locke, how does information get passed along from generation to generation. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the method by which memory is maintained, but definitely they were used later in the Roman period by the um, local people in the construction of their group identity through this manipulation um, of temporality in landscape. The obscurity of the origins of the people um, who built the Bronze Age barrows or may have been buried within them may have been a boon to those who wanted to imbue them um, with significance. It's not knowing made it um, available for any interpretation. Okay, so there is a so the sort of one feature that I've chosen to talk about. There's a path um, in this study area. So Canterbury is there, Dover is down here, this is the ridge and the Nailborn stream coming through like that. Um, this path extends from some Romano-British barrows on kind of a higher point here, down into the valley, past um, some villa buildings, some other Bronze Age barrows, and across to um, two Romano-Celtic temples. The sites that are linked are places where um, memory was created and memory was enacted, significant places to um, belief and to community that are linked via this path. I've been thinking about phenomenology in approaching landscape. It's difficult in this area where um, quite a lot of this is actually built up and there's the A2 running through the middle of it and you can't actually just walk along this path. But nonetheless, the bodily experience of following the path and thinking about these features that are now vanished is, is significant to, um, to trying to understand it. I've been using a combination of GIS and physically walking uh, where, where you can to try to try to do that. So the path is about um, four and a half kilometers, if you just take the sort of more direct-ish route like that. Um, <coughs> it starts on this hill up here, which is about 100 meters elevation. It goes down to in the valley to cross the stream where the villa is at like 30 meters elevation. Um, and you can see the profile of walking along the path up there. There is an easier <coughs> route, however, which is longer but flatter. So this is the, the red other optional route. Um, choosing this kind of cross-country way, which is more difficult, um, I think was an intentional choice, following this path across the grain of the topography, possibly to pause at meaningful places along the way and to look back, to be aware of the expense of energy and time was an aspect of what made following the path a significant activity. The Roman period burial mounds just here, they pass out of sight quite quickly as you follow this path because they're on this sort of flat bit of the top of a hill, so the shoulder of the hill um, obscures them from the viewer. And as you walk down into the valley, pass by the natural springs and the villa buildings and start to ascend again, um, this is quite steep just here. and. I'm sure that all of you are probably better athletes than I am, but about halfway up the hill, I do find that I you know, would quite like to pause and kind of get my breath. And just where you want to pause, there are two um, quite large Bronze Age barrows, twice the diameter of the Roman period mounds um, on the hill behind you, probably significantly eroded. But just as you reach those barrows, 
I just point that out, just as you reach those barrows, <coughs> the Roman barrows become visible again. Sort of encouraging you to turn around and look behind you. If we look at um, this viewshed of what a person could have seen when standing on the path next to the barrows, the Romano British mounds would have been visible above the crest of the hill, but not the ground that they were actually um, standing on. And from this point, within a little dip, nothing to the east or north can be seen, so you can't see in those directions, you can only look back behind you. The burial mounds atop the hill come back into view, along with the valley structures and the natural springs. So a person could look down the path, reflect on the connections that they had made with the physical movements of their body across the valley, and see the mounds more than two kilometers away. And because of the way that the path is structured, one is encouraged or even um, limited to do that. If we just look back to the visibility of the barrows um, to a viewer, you can see where they were visible from. So they pass out of view again as you continue along the path and reappear when um, a person reaches the second Romano-Celtic temple, sort of completing that journey. So the path begins at a place where mourners held funerary rituals and constructed future memories through practice and through mm -hmm. monumentality. The use of burial mounds in a part of the country where an extremely high density of Bronze Age barrows existed anyway was probably a way for the family and community to reference you know, the older monuments and to create a link between themselves <coughs> and the land through the suggestion of community continuity. By linking the new mounds with a path for moving across the landscape down to the domestic enclosure in the valley, the space for the present and for the living into the future is physically and symbolically linked to the space for the dead and for remembering. The way that the path passes between the natural springs and the villa structures uses this temporal association to connect the work and leisure of home, the spirits of place and gateway to the supernatural represented by watery places, and the practice of remembering those who have died. Because the path leads on to a Romano-Celtic temple, it also connects the future-oriented religious rituals of gratitude, worship, and request with the process of replicating memories. Connections like this across relatively large areas bring people together during the important moments of life, death, and worship that represent the cycle of the year and of the generations, all of which are embedded in this landscape. So by reflecting on the experience of being in the landscape as it relates to the uh, meaningful places as well as temporality, we can augment a phenomenological approach, especially one um, that cannot be undertaken simply on the ground. The time sacrificed from a day to following this path and leaving aside other duties is one part of it. Moving through the landscape cannot be extricated from the manipulation of temporality. The sensation of climbing up a steep slope towards great looming monuments of long dead leaders and pausing to look back the way you've come invited reflection. The similarity of the mode of constructing burial monuments over a probably incomprehensible period of time entwined these long-term pasts and futures with the short-term cycles of everyday life and practice. So rather than becoming entrenched in conservative practices and cementing an idealized construction of the past in order to create local group identities, these people were choosing new options for linking places important to their community and imbued with meaning and complex rela relationships to both past and future. Um, okay, so now um, I'm going to pick up on a couple more of these theoretical points before moving on to the second case study. So <clears throat> if we think about uh, landscape as place and place as material culture in this way, <clears throat> it aids our efforts to capture the inherent dynamism of human agency and people's creative engagements with the past and the future. But um, dealing with the future <clears throat> in the past, or indeed the present, is a serious epistemological challenge. Uh, and we want to sort of think a bit more about that at this point in our paper. <clears throat> so um, as we've already noted, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, the problem with the future uh, is that it's not obviously real. Um, but, of course, this is true of many of the other concepts we use which are um, 
similarly, not real, but real in their consequences. Um, as both of these quotes, one of which from a discussion with Barbara Adam, uh, sort of start to express, there is this problem uh, of the future <clears throat> on an epistemological level. Uh, and obviously, for that reason, many disciplines, if you think about them, are very past-oriented rather than future-oriented. Um, but again, sort of just uh, as we might talk about the unreality of the future, we might just as readily say that the past is not real, <clears throat> or at least perhaps that both past and future are only real in terms of their consequences for action in a given present moment. Um, so <clears throat> trying to think about this, though, is, I suppose, further complicated by the fact that there is not a great deal of social theory to draw upon uh, in trying to think about the future, as it's a neglected topic across many disciplines. I mean, certainly there are uh, lots of concepts of the future embedded in things like phenomenology, in Heidegger's work, or in pragmatist philosophy. Um, but for these reasons, it is, it's uh, a neglected topic. And uh, furthermore, I think in the past, or in reference to the past, past societies, um, there's a legacy of sort of temporal chauvinism uh, if you like, to deal with when we're looking um, at these issues because people in the past are often perceived um, as having attitudes to the future that are sort of bound up with cosmological concepts <coughs> which stress sort of fatalism or conservatism uh, and you know associated religious practices um, that go along with that. And I suppose, to be fair, there is some truth to that characterization for the Roman world. <coughs> um, but perhaps we could draw a distinction between, uh, fuzzy one, but between cosmological concepts of the future uh, at the sort of grand scale and more everyday routines uh, with more constrained future horizons. Um, so again, sort of tackling uh, the question of how futures impinge upon activity in a present moment is implicit in various theories concerned with social action, but um, it has only relatively recently been attracting very explicit attention, and notably in Barbara Adams' work. Uh, uh, Barbara led a major research project uh, a few years ago called In Pursuit of the Future, here uh, with a fantastic website uh, with lots of resources about the future. Um, another approach uh, which uh, gives us a sort of detailed breakdown of various aspects of futurity <coughs> is provided in a recent paper by Anne Misch, um, who draws on uh, pragmatism and phenomenology to create a typology of uh, projectivity, as she calls it. And uh, she identifies various sort of aspects of, of the future, if you like, to uh, think about, <coughs> uh, including reach, um, so uh, sort of obviously sort of how far into the future um, one is thinking about, uh, and breadth in terms of the range of possible futures, which can be more or less broad, uh, the clarity, the sort of degree of detail with, when, uh, with which one envisions the future, um, contingency, so how much uh, there's a sense of predetermination of the future, uh, expandability, you know, these are all sort of related, obviously, but touching upon slightly different things. Crucial one, really, I think, uh, again, going back to what I was saying earlier about how we conceive of past agency, uh, volition, um, you know, how passive or active people feel they are, whether we conceive of the future moving towards us or of us moving into the future. So, you know, sort of simple distinction, but quite a powerful one. Um, sociality, how social relationships uh, play out in one's imagination for the future. Uh, uh, the connectivity, <coughs> again, touching on agency and, and determination. Um, and uh, quite like this one, this touches on sort of some of the things that have come up in other sessions, for example, the science fiction session, perhaps most uh, relevant to whether we think of the future as uh, better or worse, utopian or dystopian, these sorts of things. So um, together, I think these points offer some potential um, for a, um, a, more, a sort of quite nuanced understanding <coughs> of the future dimensions of action. Um, a, uh, another crucial ingredient, I think, in shaping our approach to the future <coughs> is to consider how this aspect of temporality, obviously in relation also to the past, relates to the construction of identities. 
and as Lacey's example has already demonstrated this. Um, obviously, uh, identity is fundamentally sort of comparative, but also fundamentally temporal. <coughs> um, and past and future are often in tension in characterizing particular identity groups in relation to fundamentally to concepts of change, whether change is good or bad, whether change is to be arrested or encouraged. <coughs> and to take a topical example, uh, I think that we can say that advocates of the Leave and Remain causes uh, in the aftermath of the referendum are divided partly by different visions of the future in relation to the past, almost actually by different horizons of the past that those two, two camps want to be their future whether it's two years ago before the referendum for the Remainers or 50 years ago for the Leavers. But it's sort of about you know, the future in relation to the past. <coughs> um, and of course, other identity categories intersect with those groupings, <coughs> uh, including an urban-rural divide in the referendum and also perhaps in the past. And so it's that urban-rural relationship that um, uh, we can carry on exploring in Roman Britain. <clears throat> um, so turning to a different region of Roman Britain, uh, the second sort of case study we're uh, presenting here <clears throat> is situated in the west of Britain, in the region around uh, Sirencester, uh, in the West Country. So like um, Canterbury, Sirencester became a major public town in the late 1st and early 2nd centuries AD, and uh, of course sits in its own complex landscape. Um, famously really characterised, I guess, by the, the large villas in the northern part, uh, or to the north of Sirencester in the Cotswolds, <coughs> uh, some of the most um, sort of well-known villas in Roman Britain, although mostly, of course, excavated a really long time ago, so with quite um, limited archaeology in some ways. Um, what I'm going to talk about, though, is the Upper Thames Valley, um, to the south of Sirencester, and a couple of sites which have been excavated rather more recently, and therefore rather better, <coughs> uh, with a bit more sort of detailed material culture evidence. Uh, particularly sites excavated by Oxford Archaeology, and I'm going to talk about Cotswold Community and uh, Clayton Pike uh, in particular. <coughs> now, in terms of the ideas about projectivity that I was just uh, talking about, perhaps the most straightforward <clears throat> aspects to address looking at the archaeology of, of these rural sites um, are things to do with reach, breadth, contingency, expandability and connectivity, as well as the recurrence of the past into the future on a number of levels. And that concept of recurrence um, is embedded in <clears throat> significant ways in the cyclical rhythms of agricultural life across late Iron Age and Roman Britain. And there's quite a lot of evidence, of course, you know, from of different sorts, disparate sorts across different sites across Britain, uh, which emphasise the profound entanglement of agricultural cycles and almost all aspects of living in rural communities. So whether we consider the practical and metaphorical associations of different spaces within a roundhouse, um, and uh, this comes from a paper by Mel Giles and Mike uh, Parker Pearson, <coughs> trying to uh, think about the uh, activity structure, but also the cosmological structure of roundhouse activities in relation to uh, the sort of seasonal round of, uh, of different activities. <clears throat> um, so, different spaces in roundhouses, their orientation within enclosures or the trackways which connected enclosures. Uh, there are current patterns of seasonal activities <clears throat> uh, and repeated routines of movement. Their associations with light and dark, life and death, growth and decay, these seem all pervasive. The repetition of many agricultural practices manifests a series of attitudes to the future based upon reproduction of what was done in the past to secure the continuation of food production, <coughs> minimising risk and entailing perhaps other uh, sets of cyclical concepts to do with reciprocity uh, in terms of social relationships which connect interdependent communities. Um, so the farmsteads uh, that I mentioned in the Upper Thames Valley exemplify this well, <coughs> yielding evidence for routines, risk aversion, and, <coughs> and actively maintained continuity, and therefore perhaps uh, a somewhat narrow reach and breadth of futurity. For example, <coughs> many of the enclosure boundaries 
uh, both sites I've mentioned. Here's an example from uh, Clayton Pike. Um, exhibits characteristic signs of repeated maintenance, recutting, and minor adjustments along established lines. So a major ditch line, but loads of, of sort of repeated actions on roughly that same alignment to keep it uh, maintained. Um, the environmental evidence gives the clearest indications of the usual cycles of plant growth and processing, what, animal breeding and management. So, the, uh, for example, the inhabitants of Clayton Pike focused on haymaking in the mid-Roman period, which involves distinct rhythms of labour organisation uh, with points of high demand. So that brings in the social aspects of uh, planning for the future. <clears throat> um, and uh, these, uh, in fact, also might be linked to uh, other sort of social cycles of regular festivals at which the bonds of reciprocity could be forged. Uh, so uh, Clayton Pike has uh, been interpreted to have various status and uh, activity subdivisions across the site, as you can see here. <coughs> um, and uh, there's evidence for <coughs> uh, feasting from the faunal assemblage. So one can imagine sort of periodic and obviously planned uh, feasting activities to do with uh, reciprocity between the estate uh, owners and their labour force. And so all of these features might be interpreted as emphasising a predictable and repetitive future orientation. <clears throat> but this isn't the whole story and other um, framings of the future are manifest in different aspects of these places as material culture. Most clearly these are visible at points of disjuncture in the site sequences. And interestingly, there are some consistent patterns across the region in terms of different sites with quite similar kind of horizon points, <clears throat> which indicate certain periods where decisions had to be made uh, that represented at least a partial break with the past, and therefore a different concept of the future. Um, so there's quite um, uh, widespread episodes of change uh, in the uh, early to mid second century the end of the 3rd, beginning of the 4th century, and unsurprisingly perhaps around the end of the 4th century. So the major phases here at Cotswold Community uh, in the uh, late Iron Age shifting into the mid-Roman period with quite uh, significant replanning of the site, and again into the late Roman period. And at uh, Clayton Pike, again, <coughs> the early Roman uh, layout there, and it's uh, sequence, sorry, uh, significant change into the late Roman period. Um, so, I mean, how one reads into these kind of replannings of sites is an interesting question about what that's intended to achieve in the future. Um, but, you know, in, the, in sort of these horizons where things seem to change uh, over an area, <coughs> periods of uncertainty, um, so mechanisms of controlling the future may have offset the risks associated with changing the agricultural focus or the settlement organisation of these communities. Uh, at Cotswold Community, um, uh, mid-Roman burials were placed into long-standing boundary features. Um, and uh, in uh, the late Roman phase, burials were associated with a still visible Bronze Age barris. This evokes some of the things that Lisa was talking about earlier. Um, just in terms of how these different changes map on, uh, this diagram here is <clears throat> attempt to visualise when um, or how the balance between continuity and change is sort of sustained across different spheres of life. So the structural sequence here, so where the shading is a period of significant change, these are the horizons I was talking about in settlement planning. In terms of other activities we can read from material culture, some changes like in terms of the, the pottery assemblage kind of coincide, others are on their own sort of sequence. So one can envisage that you know there might be big changes in one aspect of life, like how you build your house, but how you eat or how you um, dress is uh, not changing at the same time. So there's uh, there's threads of continuity and and change. Um, and through ritual action like the burials, also continuity can be constructed and maintained. Um, and in a similar vein to the, the burials there at Clayton Pike, uh, ritual features include a possible foundation deposit of a sheep burial in the um, early 2nd century old building and a late Roman shrine, as well as other boundary burials. So um, in this vein, and just as we saw in, in Kent, seeking to control the past 
is really about the future. <clears throat> and all of these features can be uh, seen in the same light, taking us into the notions of volition and connectivity in Nietzsche's <coughs> scheme. And returning also to Barbara Adams' discussion of cultures with an emphasis on fate, uh, this can be detected in a good deal of Roman religious practice with its augury and sort of prognostication. Um, but equally, widespread evidence of the kinds of practices that I've been discussing here show how people sought to influence the future, whether or not they believed that influence was mediated by other agencies. In this, and every other aspect of the archaeology of these rural settlements, we can see <clears throat> just how much of the materialization of landscape is imbued with ideas about temporality and the relationship between past and future. So, uh, to conclude, um, we've selected these two case studies uh, because they highlight distinct but interlocking aspects of the materialization of time uh, in particular places. In viewing place as material culture, we're seeking to join up <coughs> Some of the disparate approaches to past experience of landscape with biographical perspectives on sites and artifacts and studies of the involvement of objects in the shaping of identities. The architecture broadly defined of these uh, settlements and their situation in relation to other features in the landscape are important parts of the temporal orientation of the people who constructed and lived in them. Um, together with movement along the pathways which connected them, these are all practices, practices which both took time and made time. Especially in a context like Roman Britain, the political dynamics of imperialism, the introduction of an urban-rural relationship, requires to interrogate the evidence carefully, as both of these relationships obviously involve contested times, or the potential for that. Um, and we've emphasised the necessity of thinking about the future dimensions of this process, because it's fundamentally important, really, to how... Uh, understanding how people act in their time, and also because stereotypes about conservatism and creativity are easy to fall into. These sorts of stereotypes are you know, all pervasive now, and uh, as we enter an unexpectedly lively uh, 21st century, um, these sorts of uh, things, the relationship of the past and the future, <clears throat> whether we're going back um, to the future, um, are, uh, you know, uh, embedded in all the political debates of the day. Once we start to consider how the diaphanous, diaphanous notion of the future shapes everything we do, it's hard to escape the conclusion that it is actually the most important tense of time. Um, while seeing the past from the present is unavoidable, we need to identify our own temporal preconceptions and try to reimagine the future from the perspective of a person walking across the Bourne Park landscape or recrossing a ditch in a Cotswold community. By understanding the diversity of people's time concepts, we also contribute to the role the past plays in shaping our own future right now. Thank you very much.